Hi everyone, number one Marmaduke fan here. I was at first I was gonna try out the go live feature and try live streaming, streaming, but wah wah, I found out that it uses my webcam and I, I haven't figured out how to live stream live stream a video, a screen recording yet. So uh, I'll figure that out. But since uh, originally my idea was gonna be my first live stream would be my reaction to my absolute favorite piece of feminist performance art ever. This gives me so much joy and so much laughter in my soul. And what I realized about Ma Martha Rosler's Semiotics of the ki Kitchen is that the sheer unbridled joy I experience watching this is comparable to uh, the time I got to look at Leonardo da Vinci's Virgin on the Rocks and uh, Michelangelo's David. And then as I thought about those works, I remembered some cool stories about them. And they, I do want to share these stories, and I can't think of any other way to segue them in. So summa tangentum, I'm going to tell you my story about getting to look at the actual uh, Virgin, on, Virgin of the Rocks by Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo's uh, David. And uh, the, the, so, let me think. Uh, so let's start with the Virgin on the Rocks, because... There's super tangentum. Let's start with the Virgin on the Rocks because uh, there's less of a story to this and more of just an interesting observation. So uh, there are two versions of this painting, one from 1483, owned by the Louvre in Gay Paris, and one from 1495, owned by the National Gallery in London. Now, take this story with a grain of salt because memory could be failing me, but I have seen both of these individually in, in their original locale. And... Uh, if, I, if memory serves, when I was in the National Gallery, several uh, paintings by da Vinci were on loan from the Louvre to the National Gallery in London, which meant that while I was there, I got to look and then turn around and look at the other version of these two paintings. And uh, it was sort of like watching Uncle EVS redraw his rough drafts or watching Diversity in Comics uh, draw over one of his drawings, But ex except, except it's Leonardo da Vinci who you're getting to compare and contrast and see how he adjusts a composition. And uh, number one is there are some very slight compositional differences like the angel's hand is pointing at Christ in the older version at the Louvre, and her hand is not included in the second version, but her eyes are changed. So she's looking directly at you in the audience in the Louvre painting, but she's looking at the Christ child with a sweet expression in the National Gallery painting. Second, the light and shadow and color are almost completely di different between the two. The Virgin on the Rocks looks more sturdy, more earthy, more uh, warm and fleshy in, in the hue. But the uh, National Gallery version has much more cool hues. They're almost blue in their skin. And the Virgin, the Virgin Mary, her dress is a bright blue that almost glows, whereas it's darker in the old version. I just remember looking back, looking forth, looking back, looking forth. And uh, the reason I thought of this painting is these two paintings is this is the best illustration I've ever seen after seeing multiple examples of da Vinci's, Leonardo da Vinci's work. My teacher would be mad at me if uh, she heard I ever said da Vinci instead of Leonardo da Vinci. That'd be like saying Nebraska instead of ya boy Zach of Nebraska. Anyway, so uh, the reason I want to talk about this is this is the perfect illustration of why it's worth your time to go see a painting in a museum rather than just look at it on a TV screen or a computer screen or a book. I love art books, but there's no way you're going to be able to, you can appreciate what he's doing with paint without going to see it. But the whole point of the way he's using paint is that you can appreciate it in real life and see what he's doing. So da Vinci's way of looking at light and shadow, I think, came from his scientific understanding and his scientific observations on light and atmosphere. So he was probably one of the first people to figure this out. But uh, light behaves differently based on how far away it is, based on the weather conditions, based on uh, the thickness of the air, and he would perform experiments to adjust the effect of light in his studio space. Uh, and this is called atmospheric perspective, or the Italian term would be sfumato. And so what that means is when he paints uh, living people, he uses a very soft effect of light, which is informed by his very unique way of thinking about light and shadow. Uh, where da Vinci would use very, very, very thin layers of paint to build up the shadows. And we're talking so thin that it's probably on a microscopic level, and he would achieve a full range of tones with these 
incredibly thin layers of paint, meaning that when it's not like a gorky image on this TV screen, when you're seeing it in person, it seems to glow uh, because you're not just seeing the paint, you are seeing the light pass through the paint and then reflect back on you and it shimmers and it shines. And I like both version on the rocks, but I think the later version on the rocks really pumps up the glow effect. Like the, let's go back. The other one, I actually kind of like the babies a little bit more. The babies look a little bit more cheerful and lifelike, but the later version on the rocks much more clearly shows Da Vinci's unique way of looking at the light at light and shadow. So he's still got a soft effects of light and shadow here, but as he matures and grows and continues his experiments, he, he cools down his color palette and he, uh, it, th this seems much more luminous because he's pumping the effect or the contrast of light and shadow. And it's an effect you can only appreciate in person because the thinness of the paint affects how it works. Uh, to illustrate the difference, you could contrast this with Rembrandt's style, who is not using thin layers of shadow on top of white. He's using thick layers of white on top of shadow. So it's a 180 degree uh, different perspective to using light and shadow than Da Vinci. I got to see this uh, 1661 self-portrait of Rembrandt in Kenwood, London. I, I remembered correctly. And I think I stood in front of this painting for about 45 minutes and I remembered this white chunk of paint on his forehead and this little bright white yellow highlight on his hair and these thick sweeps to make his hat. So this is completely the opposite of how Da Vinci uses paint. If we go down here, here's his dark purplish black in the background. You can see the whites on top of that, the red, the, the whites on top of that black, the red apron is on top of the white. You can see a scratch in there. You climb up here and look at his nose. So he's built up sort of the reddish paints and then the yellowish paints and then this white highlight right here and on the forehead. And this is impasto paint. It is a thick use of paint, which is almost sculptural. And again, the screen can't capture what it looks like in person because it's so thick, you can move your head and you can see the three dimensionality of the paint. It's a sculptural way of using painting to build up the face and the nose and the forehead. It's, it's abstract because you know, you don't really have a big bulge on your forehead, but he's pumping up that light to, to it, it's incredible. It's both Da Vinci and Rembrandt are punching up light and shadow to create this really rich three dimensional effect, but they're doing it with completely different paint applications. And it's something you can only appreciate by looking at their work. So I don't know, I need a hashtag move the needle for going to art museums and, and seeing this stuff. So uh, I love art. So uh, that is that, that that that's the only story I have about the Virgin on the Rocks is that I had the opportunity to see both of them in the same room together, probably for the first time in history. My story about the David might be more interesting because I might be one of the few people on planet Earth who have who has gotten to see the David at precisely the angle I've gotten to see it. So I have not seen the original sculpture in Italy, but I have seen the plaster cast at the Victoria and Albert Museum. This is the room. And a plaster cast is a direct copy. It's not someone, you know, it's not like Michelangelo's next door neighbor, second cousin Mario, trying to do his best job to imitate Michelangelo's style. It's literally a carbon copy of the original in plaster. So there might be a very slight deterioration of the surface details because it's a copy. It's like a Xerox. But if you're an artist who wants to draw Michelangelo's David, drawing the plaster cast at the Victorian Albert is the functional equivalent of seeing the original because you get to see it life size as it originally was. You get to see all the forms and shadow and light and shape of it. So I go to the Victorian Albert and there was a massive installation artwork there by a contemporary artist. I don't know if it's still there. It's probably gone, but it was this giant house made of chipboard right next to the David. And you were allowed to go inside this house and walk up and down the stairs. And I didn't even look up the artist's name, whoever he, he or she was. They deliberately put some windows next to the hat hand and next to the face. So you could walk up the steps, look out the window, and you could see uh, the David's hand right in front of you. And you could see the David's face right in front of you. Uh, and what that means is if that installation is gone, that means you, you will probably never get the chance to see the uh, Michelangelo's David from a bird's eye view instead of from a worm's eye view. Now, this is a story which you also, also should take with a grain of salt, but my uh, Renaissance art teacher, the Renaissance man, uh, we'll call him, uh, 
was very thorough. So even though I haven't checked this myself, I tend to believe it because my teacher would read the original Renaissance documents in their original language. He was very thorough about what he said in class. So I completely believe this is true. He would show us examples of Donatello and uh, Michelangelo's work, and he would make the argument that uh, because uh, Donatello and Michelangelo were very aware of the, the, you know, the laws of perspective, they would adjust the proportions of their sculpture with that in mind. So Michelangelo, when he sculpts the David, knows that you're going to be standing at kind of this low view looking up at it. And it's a massive sculpture. So when you see it from this low angle, it's in perspective. It's like his head shrinks. So Michelangelo would wanted to compensate for this. So what did he do? He made my, the David's head larger than classical proportions and his shoulders larger than classical proportions, but very subtly so that when you look up and it's foreshortened and the head is smaller because it's farther away from you, it doesn't look like he's got a tiny little dinky head. It looks like he has sort of a nice sized head because Michelangelo has literally made his head slightly larger than it should be to compensate for your low view. And uh, it could, again, take this with a grain of salt. Maybe I only saw this because my teacher told me to look for it. But when I went up here and I looked right at into the Michelangelo's, uh, David's eyes from this, from this perspective, I could swear I could see it. it. It was subtle. It wasn't like he had a massive Japanese chibi head, but his head looked massive to me from this angle. And it was an angle that Michelangelo may have never intended for people to be able to see it from. And um, um, if that installation is gone, which it probably is, this was years ago, no one may ever get to see Michelangelo's David from that angle again, unless they're a re restoration worker or something. And I think this image might show it too, where when we see Mike, the head of the David from straight on, that looks like a big old massive head, doesn't it? And even his eyes look very massive. So. Uh, like I said, my teacher was, the Renaissance man was very thorough in what he talked about and how he used original sources. So I give him the benefit of the doubt and I 100% believe that this is a correct appraisal of Michelangelo's work. So that is my story about the Michelangelo's David, my chance to get to see both versions of the Virgin on the Rocks. I only thought of those because those were the first two artworks I thought of when it comes to getting sheer joy out of enjoying a work of art. So with that, here is my reaction to Martha Rosler's Semiotics of the Kitchen. I watched this years ago, of course, in art school, so this isn't entirely a virgin reaction, but I haven't watched this in two years, so you are getting somewhat of a virgin reaction. Oh, no, 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 no. Go away. Go away. All right, awesome. Let's turn up the sound. Oh, boy. Maybe I should make this not full screen so I don't get a copyright strike. <laughs> Nineteen seventy five, M. Rossler, Semiotics of the Kitchen. One of these days I'll figure out live stream guys and you can have great super chat comments. <laughs> I'm probably gonna edit out some of this dead space. Careful now. <laughs> What's that on her bookshelf, Four. mother? Oh, I've never noticed that before. <laughs> Watch out, guys.
Woman, where's my cheese? Hamburger press. Da da da, cucaracha. I'm trying not to act up too much, guys. Oh! Oh, that's how they took out Lenin, right? The Bolsheviks took out Lenin with an ice pick, am I remembering correctly? Yes, sir. Knife. Banned in Britain. <laughs> Watch out, guys! <laughs> oh, she is ticked. She is so triggered. Throwing away the soup. <laughs> Honey, you got hot soup all over Explano. Why? Oh, I missed what she said. Oh, they're measuring spoons. <laughs> oh, now there's sugar on the cat. Honey. <laughs> no. Oh, honey, you're horrible at this. I know exactly what she's imagining while she's cracking nuts. I know exactly what's going through her mind. Opener. <laughs> Need some help? Need some help opening that? Pan. <laughs> There's pancake batter all over the oven. Oh, no. Your boat gently down the street. Spoon. Oh man. Oh, I want. I wonder if anyone got this catch. I wonder if any man was lucky enough to earn her. She mad, boys. <laughs> mm-hmm. You go, girl. Woman needs man like a fish needs a bicycle. So, uh, this is why uh, MGTOWs are a thing. You, you think it's a weird YouTube thing? It's a thing because of stuff like this. yippee ki -yay. Let's see here. Sh should I ironically like it or should I dislike it? Uh, I do ironically like it, so I'm gonna like this. So hi there, hi there, Rampage movie. Hey, no free advertising for you. Okay, <laughs> I'm number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys. Uh, we were not sponsored by the Rampage movie. <laughs> and I'll catch you later.